All right. Listen up, Deutsch fans. We have a collaboration going between previous podcast guest, the lovely Matilda Sundel, and our own David Deutsch, who just released an article called Optimism, Pessimism, and Cynicism. And this article is released through uh, Matilda's company, Warp News, whose mission is to spread fact-based optimism and cool news about technology, science, and yeah, human progress in general. So I'm going to link to the article in the show notes. I suggest you head on over to warpnews.org to check it out, as well as subscribe to the weekly newsletter, which I've got my dad hooked on it. <laughs> he can't stop texting me about how good it is. Yeah, it's always nice to have some human ingenuity drop into the mailbox on a weekly basis. And also, if you're a fan of Do Explain, please consider going over to Apple and rating and reviewing the podcast five stars. That helps me spread the word a little more and get out to more people. So that would be much appreciated. All right, that's it for promo. Let's get into the episode. All right, we're back for part two with the lovely Jake Orthwine. How you doing, man? I'm excellent, man. Good to be here. So everyone knows we've spent 40 minutes struggling with technical issues. So despite all the meditation and emotional work, I'm fucking pissed. <laughs> but um, that's I'm, I'm going to use that. I'm going to channel it in the conversation. Good, good. Yeah, so last time, I mean, we, we left on a pretty exciting cliffhanger there. And uh, we've been getting some good feedback. And I know you've been having some conversations with people. Uh, Chapman was happy about it. I know you spoke to Lucas Smalden, who I personally haven't chatted with, but I'm a big fan of his blog, barelyatweet.com, I think it's called. Uh, everyone yeah, bar should bar 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 that. Barely more than a tweet.com. Right, right. Yeah, it's a brilliant concept. So yeah, we have some stuff to work with today, and um, let's jump right in. I think you ended with saying something along the lines of uh, why universal epistemology, why that's not the right way to think about it. Mm. Because in Chapman's conception, knowing different things uh, is different. And thinking about it in terms of a universal theory is is mistaken on his right. view. So that could be a really cool thing to touch on. I also think we should go through the reasonableness, rationality, and Meta rationality distinction that he makes, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and then let's see where where that takes us. Maybe we can tie in some Twitter questions into what we're talking about there, and also the nebulosity, uh, which we'll describe versus the fallibilism point, because many people seem to conflate these two. Mm -hmm. uh, and Chapman would say that nebulosity is ultimately the nail in the coffin for why CR doesn't work. So I think that'd be good if we could hash that out a little bit how does that sound that's un that sounds really good yeah and, and I, I think it's not just for, uh, for the nebulosity point it's not just why cr doesn't work it sort of remains to be seen you know which version of cr is rationalist in, in chapman's sense and which aren't but but um but yeah, yeah it, it's the nail in the coffin of rationalisms uh as as he defines them but uh yeah i think all, all of that sounds good as far as i understand the the Deutschen conception Knowing something always uh, entails having a model of it somehow, whether it's – it doesn't have to be in words. I mean, ultimately, the the, the highest level of explanation, I suppose, is the, the uh, verbal explanation, the explicit one. But then even the inexplicit and unconscious knowledge uh, seems to be – claimed to be this propositional, uh, mm. true or false correspondence type knowledge that we – uh, criticized in the last episode. Right. So um, what what does it mean, provided that's the way you see it too, uh, what does it mean in Chapman's conception to know something? Uh, what does it mean to understand something? How does that work if it's not a universal theory? Yeah, well, so so answering in a general way what it would mean to know somebody, something would kind of undermine... Uh, the fact that he's claiming that there isn't some single unitary thing that is cosmology, <laughs> right. so you're not you're not going to quite get a, a general answer, but, right, but right. I'll, I'll 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 try to explain it a little bit better. So, um, 
one way of thinking about this, we, we, we spoke a bunch last time in, in some of our earlier episodes about this uh, switch from thinking about ontologies as, uh, which is to say, you know, uh, conceptual schemes that parse the world into objects, categories, properties, and relationships. Uh, that's how we're using ontology here. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's a switch from thinking about that as a kind of uh, mirror of the world to thinking of it as a tool with which we, uh, you know, accomplish our purposes in the world. Um, and so it's not that there aren't, that it isn't coherent to speak in terms of representation in some cases, but it's not, mm-hmm. I mean, le- for example, last time we spoke about how uh, it's necessary to have kind of affordance style representations, which is to say representations in terms of the possibilities for action before you can have these sort of crystallized object-like representations. Um, and this has to do with sort of, uh, you know, problems with the rationalist way of thinking about categories, right? So we spoke about this last time, you know, there are unenumerably many, you know, properties that things share. So if you were trying to determine categories by listing the things that they share and excluding the things that they don't share, it, that, just, that just wouldn't be a tractable way of dealing with it. So part of the way we right. see the world in terms of objects in the first place is, is by first being able to conceive it in terms of its affordances for uh uh, see them in terms of their affordances for action. So, um, but the the more general sort of picture of uh, meanings here, as Chapman would say, uh, where meaning is not exclusively sort of propositional meanings, right? Um, and that's that's sort of the point. Um, his more general picture of meanings are that they're sort of tools for getting things done in the world, right? So so uh, meanings are are functional. They they help us accomplish certain purposes. Um, within certain contexts, and um, so with that, with that said, like um, you know, the epistemological view, the sort of project of of rationalisms, and we'll we'll sort of table the question of whether critical rationalism um, is subject to this criticism. But um, the epistemological view tends to be to say there's a single thing called knowing, uh, and everything that we sort of colloquially put under the banner of knowing is uh, more or less somehow an approximation more or less effectively more or less implicitly you know with this word implicit left sort of sort of ambiguous uh of mm-hmm. that single kind of knowing right so um and and in the case of rationalisms that single kind of knowing is said to be propositional of uh, in some way or another right? which is to say its aim is correspondence theoretic truth about the world even if it can never fully accomplish it and um that's sort of analogous to um saying that all tools are secretly hammers you know like <laughs> like implicitly or not a <laughs> screwdriver is a hammer you know and and and, and <laughs> put put that way it seems sort of silly right but like 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 there's there's one thing that all the tools are trying to to do so what's the tool that's the sort of quintessential version and we'll reduce all the other ones to that. When you when you start taking up this tool conception, it doesn't it doesn't seem to make sense to think of it that way. Um, does that sort of make sense? Yeah, I think so, but but would would Chapman agree uh, calling knowledge uh, abstract information like in, in Popper's conception, useful information? or Deutsch's information with causal power, would that be compatible with his view? Because then you have something that is shared on a very high abstract level between all knowledge, right? Which makes it intuitive to me that you could know. Um, I still don't don't really... I mean, this is super deeply ingrained in my nervous system, and this is how I spent the last three years thinking about everything. So yep. you're gonna you're gonna have to help me hammer this down or screwdriver it down, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's secretly hammering it down. Um, okay, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no but th- th- this is very helpful. So, so um, the this word information is a little bit of a tricky one, right? So, so there's a, a sort of mathematical uh, rigorous concept of information, um, and then there's a sort of colloquial semant- uh, semantic and and uh, sort of meaning laden concept of information, and they're not quite the same thing right so um um the the kind of information that is substrate independent that is the physical kind that deutsch would study in in, in his work as a physicist is this yeah. 
sort of technically technically defined mathematical quantity type thing and is that the the shannon information uh yeah there there are shannon information is sort of one of them there's like fisher information there uh, there's a a few different conceptions of it but the point is that they're all a technical they're not the same as like colloquial uh uh, information is colloquially used that the word you know like they're not this um and 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 crucially they tend not to uh involve meaning right the point is that it's just a purely sort of syntactic uh quantitative measure um not not something that has aboutness or that's that's discussed in terms of its aboutness right which is part of why this these whole this whole set of questions about aboutness doesn't really show up but but uh um there's there's sort of more to be said about like you know Deutsch is making a little bit of a stronger case here right so so um uh the idea of, of the sort of intuition behind information, as I tend to think about it, is just that it's something that's a, a particular way relative to all the ways it might be, such that getting it to be in that particular way, you know, requires the expenditure of work or something like that. You know, it's like um, the analogy I often used is like, you know, you've got uh, a bunch of uh, gas particles bouncing around in a room. Uh, if you wanted to take it from that sort of very disordered state and put it in a very particular ordered state, that would take a lot of energy. Um, and mm. information is, uh, in, in genes or in brains as, as, as Deutsch would conceive of it is just being in a particular way, uh, or abiding by particular patterns relative to the other patterns that they could abide by. And this sort of gets tied to a physics picture by talking about, so actually strangely, I mean, you, you spoke about it as an abstraction Deutsch, uh, at least when he's thinking in constructor theory terms, I think we'll say, uh, information is always physical even though it's an abstraction which is sort of strange right so so uh you can't have non-physical right, information right yeah. um so right. at least from my point of view it's just helpful to think about it in physical terms right it's like a physical system arranged in a particular way so when you say that information uh doesn't have any meaning is that the same as saying like okay you just have a certain pattern in a brain but but it doesn't say what it's about or um, yeah, it's it's not the certain... information. It's not the information doesn't have meaning exactly. Uh, Inherent meaning. Y- y- uh, it's that the concept of inf- the, this mathematical concept of information doesn't have anything to do with meaning, right? So, so it's just so, saying th- th- this yeah. many ones and this many zeros, but what it represents is not is not. Yeah, it's not relevant. And then there there right. are ways of talking about uh, there are ways of trying to reduce semantic con- notions of meaning to this this um, this ones and zeros idea by saying. You know, there's some information in the thing in the world, and the information in the thing representing it is sort of isomorphic to it in some way, right? Like it's like, uh, and um, so so it's not that it, it it sort of there aren't versions that say it it can have meaning, but the point is that the concept of information as such is not about meaning. Um, it's just okay. about being a particular way, right? Yep. And <clears throat> so if you if you take the example of like genes in a niche, um, uh the information that the genes come to contain like the particular way they end up being because of the selection pressures being exerted by the niche are in a certain sense about the niche like like they they are the way that they are in virtue of a history of dynamic interaction with the niche right um yeah the genes are yes but yeah but um if they were just that way randomly you know, if they just happened to be in that configuration and they were on a different planet and this organism was going to get, you know, selected out of the gene pool, pool in a second, uh, well, it wouldn't be super coherent to talk about those genes being about the, the niche. You know what I mean? Like, they're mm-hmm. just a particular way, right? <laughs> uh, the, 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 the way that they are has nothing to do with the niche, right? It may even be maladaptive within the niche, right? But if you, if you have an organism that's evolved in a niche and is, is, is fit... Uh, then, in a certain sweat, in a certain manner of speaking, the information contained in the genes is about the niche in that it reflects a history of interaction with the niche. Does that make sense? Yeah, it sounds similar to the uh, the loop between perception and cognition and action that you spoke about last time. Like it, it it's is a indeed yeah. causal yeah. interplay between the gene and the niche. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and this is why. Um, so that gene concept to me is 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 
relatively unproblematic as long as you're specific about what you mean by saying it contains knowledge or something like that. Whereas when you're talking about things that don't have this history of dynamic interaction, but you want to still say it's the same, uh, like you, you, you run into trickier territory, right? Like it actually matters that the interaction between the, the, the genes and the niche is in some sense physically causally efficacious, you know? Um, um, so, like, so do you mean that abstract, like thinking about Paris as the capital of France doesn't have the same relationship or what do you mean by? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, so, so, so it's not, it's not that there isn't some kind of dynamic interaction going on there. In fact, that's, that's what I'm saying is going on there, but it's not dynamic mm-hmm. interaction with Paris, right? Uh, uh, you know, it's not clear what that would even right. mean, but like, yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah. It's, it's not as though Paris as a thing is sort of exerting the selection pressure on you exactly now. But I mean, like I'll, I'll sort of steel man this, this, this other view a little bit, like, it's not the niche as an abstraction either that's that's exerting selection pressure on the organism. It's specific things that are end up killing it off. But um, th- there's just more to be said when you want to talk about how uh, dynamic interaction is giving uh, information in brains meaning, uh, if, to the extent that that's how you want to interpret it, um, than just... Th- than just uh, selection from among other ideas in the mind of the organism, which is sort of the critical rationalist account, right? So the the idea is that you might have experiments every once in a while. You're getting a little bit of uh, perceptual input, but it's heavily, heavily theory laden. <laughs> and most of what's going on in cognition is competing, I, like selection pressures among ideas that you're already representing in your head. And that that's just not. If it's true, it's so vague that it's not helpful. But 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 there's there's it's not really true either, um, especially when you think about the selection pressures being in terms of the propositional content of the ideas, which you haven't yet explained with this information account, because this idea of information is not about representational mm-hmm. content to begin with. Right. But so how, how okay? So can you uh, just explicate how that uh, ties into the the idea of knowing? universally versus the right, okay so, it, so your initial question was you know would chapman object to this information concept and uh, no, no he wouldn't it, it's just it's just a matter of like um being much more sort of detailed about uh where the information is in what sense you get from mere uh sort of uh syntactic information mathematical information to semantic information um and <clears throat> is it all in the brain all, is all the computation that's happening in the brain and stuff like that like those are all places that 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 he would object but you know it's it's uh it's not this concept of information that's 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 the problem um so mm. okay to go back to this idea of like what does it mean to know um so in the case of the um genes and the niche right to the extent that we want to say that the genes contain knowledge about the niche, it's nothing intrinsic to the information or the genes, or, you know, it's nothing intrinsic to the information that the genes contain that makes them about the niche, right? Um, right. Like, like we can interpret them as being that way, and it's helpful to interpret them as being that way, given some account of a history of dynamic interaction between the two, such that we can say the only way the genes would end up being this way, you know, as if they've survived selection pressures, um, which, which means that they're, you know, adaptive within the niche. But, um, but yeah, there's nothing intrinsic to the information. So just invoking this concept of information doesn't solve your intentionality questions, right? It doesn't solve your aboutness questions. Um, Mm. um, so then, then, uh, to, to go to this question of, you know, what does Chapman mean by, knowing or meaning in different ways there are different kinds of intentionality there are different ways that different kinds of knowledge so to speak are related to the world so you know uh um and being expressed in the common medium sort of of information processing you uh it, it's 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 useful for some for some purposes and not other not not for others to, to think of it that way but like the, the point is that the the kind of knowledge that lets you grasp things uh, with your hand, uh, or just mm-hmm. open and close your fingers, is different in important ways than the knowledge that says Paris is the capital of France. Uh, and 
the kind of the account of intentionality, uh, the, the the sort of details there are all uh, all different. Um, and so it's yeah, it's not enough to just say they're one thing. Their knowledge that knowledge is information, and it's through conjectures and refutations that you get it. Yeah. So you. You explained it in terms of uh, an analogy to me. I don't remember what the example was, if it was with winning or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Could yeah. you tell me that again? Because I thought that was good when I heard it. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 similar to the to the uh, the one I was just giving about tools, right? So so um, uh, you know, it's silly this idea of trying to reduce all tools to to one particular tool and saying you know all drills are secretly hammers or whatever. Um, um, so once you have this tool conception, you know, thinking of it all secretly as being one kind of tool doesn't make as much sense. But um, yeah, the, to the analogy of winning, the, the idea is just that you you have them. Um, I think they're called like ostensive concept, which is just um, the fact that we use the same word to refer to a bunch of things does uh, in in certain colloquial contexts does not mean that there is a a uh, sort of uh, perfectly discrete object under study. That is that thing. So we use the word knowledge to talk about both, you know, how we grasp our hands and how we um, and how we, you know, know that Paris is the capital of France. But mm-hmm. the that doesn't the fact that we use the same word there doesn't mean we're going to find some exactly the same process in terms of how the two of them works. And this is analogous to like, uh, you know, we use the word winning to describe a you know a process across various different types of game. Um, and what it means to win checkers is different than what it means, means when means to win lacrosse is different than what it means to win an argument, you know, like, like there's a, mm. there's a m- metaphorical relationship or like a family resemblance type relationship right, between right, right. those different instances, but there's not like, you know, a unif a grand unified theory of winning would be a very difficult thing to, to come up with, you know? That's I. That's really interesting, and it gives me a little vertigo <laughs> when I think about it in those terms. But okay, okay. so okay, so it's the same as saying that uh, these categories of not just the categories of physical stuff in the world, in the world like dogs and cups and and all those things, but the categories such as knowing and believing and winning, uh, they are also nebulous in the same sense then. Exactly. Am I getting that exactly. right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so maybe maybe it'd be good to actually uh, go a little harder at that concept because some feedback I've gotten from some critical rationalists uh, that I asked about this uh, about the Chapman stuff. It seems like many people uh, think it's just abstract hand waving uh, or like it's they they, they I, I hear a lot that they don't get how it's relevant. To them, it, it seems to be very far away from anything, far afield from anything they care about in the real world, where the Deutschian yeah. stuff seems to be like, oh, we can solve problems. They're all soluble. We just need to create more knowledge. We create it by guessing and testing. Oh, it's great. Let's let's do that, right? It's very empowering yeah. in that way. But then, funnily enough, uh, Chapman seemed to direct the same type of critique against CR, that they are just doing <laughs> ivory tower philosophizing that has no relation to what's actually going on in the world. And he's wanting to explain, no, this is what we're actually doing. Let's study what we're doing. And then it's all about becoming more efficient in your practical work in his meta rationality book. And then the spiritual, spiritual stuff from meaningness is all about how to live a better life. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, it's, it's funny that they're both interpreting each other that way. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm wondering if we can clarify that somehow. So, so uh, that'd be fun to dive into. Well, yeah, so I'm inevitably going to be clarifying it from a sort of partisan perspective here. So uh, this is not going to be all there is to say about this topic, but it is interesting that they sort of interpret each other in, in similar ways. But um, yes, from the sort of partisan on the on the Chapman end of things, uh, it's pretty clear that the account of what uh, that, that's given in the meta rationality book is much more specific than it's just conjectures and refutations, right? And uh, I'm not I'm not trying to say that that's the only thing that Deutsch says is going on, but um, yeah, there yeah. are lots of concepts that are just sort of taken to be unproblematic within a critical rationalist view. We've been discussing all these that, mm-hmm. you know, Chapman is urging you to look under the, the hood of and say, OK, how exactly does that work? Right. And the question, the sort of engineer's question of how does that work 
is the one he's trying to answer and and how can you use this uh what it's not useful for and i think this is part of what accounts for the impression that 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 people have that it's you know how does this relate to my problems it's not Mm -hmm. useful if what you think you're doing when you're reading this kind of stuff is trying to find the one true theory of epistemology so that you can feel uh this is a little bit too unfair but it's like so that you can feel secure in the knowledge that you have have the true epistemology and that things are knowable right he's not trying to give you assurances exactly that like yeah there's a right epistemology out there so progress is possible so that you you know like he is he is in a certain you know in other of his work trying to uh you know do that sort of existential reassurance thing you know meaning is real and all this stuff and, and purposes are real and it's like in a certain way he yeah. is he is providing the same sort of existential consolation that 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 people find in Deutsch's work, but uh, yeah, it's not. Um, you won't find the replacement theory of epistemology in exactly the same way as as you you might have thought you were going to find, you know, or that that people get out of Deutsch. Yes, there's an added element of uncertainty, um, and the whole idea of meta rationality. I feel like, where I mean, I I I, I can only speak for myself here, but I was trying to think about why I resisted this stuff uh, in the beginning or what, like for me, it was definitely, and I, and I think I, I made a mistake in that sense that I was, um, I mean, my whole podcast was built on this, <laughs> on this type of worldview. Right. And mm. it's so empowering. And I think we spoke about that the first time. Like it's, it's, it really matters to me that problems are soluble. And it's like you say, it's really nice to have, um, it seems like this just messes everything up for me, like the Chapman stuff. That's why it's taken me a lot of time to to uh, go into the details of it. I don't. I don't think it messes any of the important stuff up, which is which is good. No, right, um, right. And right. and I think the the some of the very core memes that that, that people get out of, of of critical rationalism, like this idea of fallibilism, like this idea that sort of progress is always open ended, that you're never sort of stably secure. Uh, and you, you're never finished and that like you know that <laughs> that optimism is good that 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 you know we can know things that progress is possible all of those good that all that good stuff is is true and useful and 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 way better than some of the alternatives on offer so you know one one could do significantly worse than to just like be a deutschian <laughs> um um uh <laughs> but but yeah i, I mean like uh, Ch- Chapman just sort of has some has some different names here here and 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 um, it can be helpful to to reflect and compare the two. There was a point you made. Yeah. Um, oh, just I'll also just say speaking from my from my own experience, um, similar to yours, like I'm not a scientist, right? So like like uh, the the explicit purpose of Chapman's meta rationality book is yes, it touches on things that sort of smack of philosophy, but. The explicit purpose in uh, of the book is to level up technical work. So for people, excuse me, um, for people who are doing, uh, you know, tasks that require technical rationality, be it science or certain kinds of management or whatever else, um, and and you know, thinking about rationality as that kind of thing as opposed to you know some epistemological concept is also specific to him. But like, um, he's he's trying to empower people to just do certain kinds of things better, uh, in in the context of technical work. And so I also had right. the experience reading of it being like, this doesn't really solve any of my problems because really what I am is just a guy who's interested in philosophy, right? Like, and yeah. you know, <laughs> I, 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 like, I like to reason about things and I like to feel like yeah. I have the, the right tools for reasoning. And it does end up being useful for that kind of thing too. But it's much more about if you're in the trenches of being in a lab, you know, how might you be misled by some folk philosophical theory that you have uh, and how can how can your ideas about what's going on there be improved you know so like if right. you look at the kinds of examples he uses in the meta rationality book they're all like in the nitty-gritty you know you're looking through the microscope does that thing you see through the microscope count as a cell or you know like that kind of that kind of example um yeah which is not super practical for me as somebody who doesn't do lots of science but but uh it, it, i don't think it can be accused of being like a uh more abstract less pragmatically grounded view in the end right so okay so let me share because i want to drill into nebulosity a little bit then so 
<laughs> I'm not going to name names here because I don't know if the person wants to be outed. But I, I had a friend of mine say <laughs> something like when I probed about like what what is the aversion with the the Chapman stuff that that makes you not think there's anything to it. And he said something like, yeah, all the critiques I leveled before. And then he also said, and then when I don't understand anything, uh, it's like someone's just drawing something on a whiteboard and saying, look, nebulosity. And like, like I'm supposed to understand, like that's the, the uh, retort when I don't get stuff. <laughs> it comes yeah, back to yeah. that. I thought that was funny. Um, but so clearly there's something here that we need to explicate a little more. And so... To be a real asshole, I'm going to use the, the full terms here. So we have ontological nebulosity. Yes. And then it's often in these circles equated with epistemological uncertainty, like the whole idea of fallibilism, right? So uh, e yes, yeah. Like the 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 first one is talking about um like how is the world actually and and when we're talking about objects and stuff which makes makes sense here it's important here uh are there actually objective ways to divide the world up into objects and properties and categories and all that uh yep. whereas the the fallibilism part and the epistemological uncertainty is just saying uh or or can can we know about it absolutely can we absolutely know the truth of it and so right. those aren't the same right and that's important so um yeah, what do we need to know about nebulosity here? Yeah, okay. So so this is this is especially for for critical rationalists. Like this is one of the great things about critical rationalism is that unlike other rationalisms, it just sort of bites the bullet and says you're never going to get certainty about any of this. The whole certainty project was a sham. Like <laughs> like uh, stop right. stop aiming for that. Um which yeah. which I think is a good thing, right? So so uh, that's one of the best features. So like fallibilism is still true, right? So like uh, I think that's I think that's a very helpful idea to have. It is a distinct mm. concept from from nebulosity, as you say. So, okay, what what is going on with nebulosity? So, um, to understand this, like uh, you have to understand how Chapman uses the concept of rationality and rationalism, um, such that you can see why he would say the common failure mode of all rationalisms. The reason why all rationalisms are doomed to failure is nebulosity so like like th this is sort of at the very center of his critique okay so yeah. one way of thinking about in just very very loose hand wavy terms to get the intuition for what he views rationalism as being is there's stuff in the world that at at some appropriate level of resolution so to speak is perfectly precise right like like um like the world is is out there chunked into things our project is to have things in our head mirror the way things are in the world, like draw the dividing lines in the same places and, and think about the mechanisms in the same way. Think about the procedures and, and, and rules governing the behavior in, in, in the same way, such that some perfectly precise thing in our head mirrors the perfectly precise thing in the world and we get, and that's knowledge, right? So, so it's for, for the thing in our head to be true of the world, would be for the precise thing in our head to mirror the precise thing in the world. Uh, and, and and that's the sort of rationalist project. So you saw us talk about it under the rubric of modeling before. If our model is precise enough, it can mirror the precision of the world. And then that's what it is to be true of the world. Does that yes, kind of make sense? In, in, yes. And in CR, um, and Deutsch's CR specifically, he's saying that, yeah, well, our models... Uh, and our statements can never be perfectly precise. And so he introduces the abstract entities, the abstract propositions that can have a truth value and be absolutely Correct. true and false about the world, right? Because I don't right, think we exactly. mentioned that in the first uh, first part. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I think we mentioned it way back. But yes, yeah, it's, it's not, not within the last episode. So this is a crucial idea is that sort of to, uh, at least to my ear, to sort of salvage this notion of, of perfect truth or falsity, uh, Deutsch... Deutsch admits that our statements, which is to say the actual things we utter or think, uh, can never be perfectly unambiguous, can never be perfectly precise. So there are all these sort of defective properties that they have that you'd want them to have from the standpoint of, of, of a rationalist theory. So he says that there are abstract propositions in 
you know, the realm of abstractions, you know, that's not really how you think about it. You just say, you know, it's not a problem to invoke abstract propositions because, you know, if they feature in their, our best explanation, they're real. So, you know, he's giving an explanation of, of epistemology that invokes this idea of abstract propositions. Those are exhaustively well-specified and precise such that they can mirror the world perfectly. And we make statements that are more or less good approximations of the correct ones of those abstract propositions, right? <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, one might ask, like, why, why all the roundabout? Why is all that necessary? <clears throat> and not all critical rationalists would say it is, but Deutsch is trying to, to, you know, view this as a rationalist theory with the normative end of, of correspondence theoretic truth. Uh, and since our statements can't have that as a, as a reasonable normative end, what he says that they have is the aspirational goal of approximating the abstract propositions that do meet that, that normative criterion, which is to say perfect correspondence theoretic truth about the world. Okay. Right. So, so what's the issue with that? Yeah. So, so the loose way of thinking about rationalisms that I just gave, you know, you can see how it's mirrored there, which is you want to have some perfectly precise thing over here in your head or in the propositions or whatever that mirrors, corresponds to the perfectly precise thing in the world such that you can say one is objectively true uh, or, or, you know, perfectly true, definitely true of the world in such a way as to like be manipulable within formal logic, you know, I mean, like, you know, so, again, different critical rationalists take this part of it more or less seriously. But, but that's why you would have this idea of propositions in the first place is like, in the rationalist tradition, you're trying to have the kinds of perfectly definite truths that you can, you know, do inference on in, in formal logic. We can't do inference on, you know, sort of truths like slippery things. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so to put it in, in more colloquial terms, like you need a solid pieces to work with, right? Solid, neat pieces to, to deduce with for them to be truth preserving. Yeah. And again, you know, uh, to, to be clear, Deutsch would definitely say every time we're actually doing logical inference or mathematical inference or anything else, uh, it's fallible. Like we're not getting that in our actual instantiation of it. Uh, that's just yes. the normative ideal that like we're, there's an abstraction that we're approximating when we do that, that, that does meet that criterion. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, the epistemological fallibilism view of this, which is the sort of Dorsian view requires that there be able to be, even if it's only in the realm of sort of, you know, not bound by time and space abstractions, these perfectly definite uh, representations of the world, right? We're wrong about them mm -hmm. always. We're always only approximating them or or just flat wrong about them. But they're, they can be there, right? The ontological mm -hmm. nebulosity claim says the world isn't like that. The world doesn't come chunked that way, which means that perfectly definitely true proposition, uh, per perfectly definite propositions couldn't be true about it, right? So, you know, again, ra if rationalism is having this perfectly precise thing over here, mirror the perfectly precise thing in the world if you're going to say the world isn't that way the the world isn't isn't chunked into into objects like that then how could the perfectly precise you know propositions be about them and what does it mean to say that that's the goal right now right, right. the reason why this is super confusing to people is that it seems to violate some kind of reductionist intuition that it's just it's just atoms or you know it's just fermions or whatever out there um uh, what do you mean it's not perfectly precise? Like, how can there be literal smudges in reality? And that's not right. what's being claimed here. There's nothing about here that's no. spooky. Uh, uh, there's nothing spooky about this. It's not undermining, you know, some sort of physicalist claim. Okay. No, what's still what realism. Is, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, sort of. Well, sort of. So, so it, uh, there's still a world out there and the world is a particular way. Um, it's not realism in the sense that like there really are objects out there in exactly the same way, um, parsed as objects, but yes, yeah, there's still a world. It's still a particular way. Uh, it's not, it's not smudgy or spooky or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you still, you, you can't invoke, oh, my truth, uh, uh in, in a new agey way at least and say that the way I want the world to be or the way I think about the world is, uh, how it is. It's not arbitrary. It's not bottomless relativism. Yeah, none of that. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, now, if I if I want to say the world is ontologically nebulous, 
but it's not spooky and smudgy out there. What does it mean to say that? Uh, and it, it has to it has to do with getting underneath this this idea of ontology defined as objects, categories, properties, and relationships, right? So, um, uh, okay, here's here's a here's a I'm gonna get this a little bit wrong because I'm not a physics type person, and and uh, I'll, I'll probably get the details wrong. But to take a property, right? So 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 the sort of ontological view of things says that there are objects or 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 you know things that have properties, right? That's like one way, like simple way of thinking about what's going on in the world. And they're related to each other. So there are these discrete things out there. They're related to each other in various ways and they have properties. Mm -hmm. Pretty intuitive, right? Yep. For instance, me, I'm handsome, I'm tall, I'm charming. Properties. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's a perfectly discrete Chris out there and he's handsome and tall and charming (laughs) objectively, right? Like this is is just obviously true. This is actually the one exception to to nebulosity. This is just perfectly true. Yep. There's there's one abstract proposition and it's the claim that Christopher is handsome and tall and charming. Um, (laughs) uh, And it is is true. Um, Okay. So, so, okay. So, so, but yeah, this idea that there there are things out there and that those things have, have properties is pretty intuitive. Um, now, uh, if I were to say, uh, and the, those those properties are intrinsic to the thing; they're objective in the sense of being they're in the thing, they're in the object, right? They're not they're not something you arbitrarily attribute to it, right? Right. So, um, tastiness is not an objective attribute of a thing in exactly the same way. Now, the critical rationalist move here would be like, okay, but you could take a third person point of view on the scene of you and your relatedness to the thing, and then it's objective to say it's tasty for you. That's not the point. The point is for the person who finds it tasty, they're not they're not reading into something that's just in the object. It's a property of their relatedness to the thing, their interaction with the thing, that tastiness as a as an as a property emerges. Make sense? Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. So it's not intrinsic to, you know, a piece of steak that it is tasty. It's tasty for some organisms, right? <laughs> like, like tastiness, you know, is, a, is an interactive property. Yes. And I mean, people differ in what they, they think is tasty as well. So, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. So, so on the, on the sort of more subjective end, you have something like tastiness, but I'm not going to say tastiness is perfectly subjective either. It's not totally independent of the properties of the, of the, uh, of the thing. But it, no, uh, of, or, 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 of of what the thing is like, um, just to avoid using this word properties again. But mm-hmm. um, but it's not perfectly objective, like intrinsic to the thing. Okay, then you might ask, okay, like what is a perfectly objective property of the thing? And you know, an example that Chapman uses here is like uh, gravitational mass, right? Like that seems pretty objective. Like if something's mm-hmm. got mass, it's pretty objective. But you, it, uh, we sort of only know about the existence of gravitational mass as an idea based on how things exert uh, uh, you know, gravitational force on other objects. So it's more like a kind of relational property than it is an intrinsic property of a thing. Uh, the claim about gra- gravitational mass is the claim about how things interact with other things, right? So this thing that seemed to be an intrinsic mm. property is also a function of how it relates to other physical things. And then this idea of like an intrinsic property just sort of gets more and more confusing as you try to drill down and make it more and more objective, right? Even when you're talking about physics and like mass, okay? To say nothing of color or uh, tastiness, right? Like you can move more in the sort of obviously, if not subjective, like more subjective end of the of the spectrum, right? So already we have an idea mm. of properties as not being things that are intrinsic to the world, in, in exactly the right way. They're, they're ways of relating to the thing in the world. You know, like they're, they're interactive properties rather than objective properties. Right. I mean, it sounds kind of um, Alan Wattsian. I know you sent me a lecture that you thought was in line with this, but I mean, yes. I, m- my favorite Alan Watts uh, video on YouTube is when he's walking, hands on his back, because of course, uh, in a forest... And being mm-hmm. all wise and stuff. And he's talking about how, you know, the world is wiggly, right? Yep. <laughs> and and it's kind of like what we are w- doing w- 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 is... W- wiggle, wiggles and bits. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, uh, wiggle them bits is not a good thing to say. But uh, yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, it, it's uh, like um, uh, the world is this big 
slew this big mass. It has pattern, which Chapman would say, right? So it's not completely arbitrary, but it's yep. this big thing. And then we uh, like put this grid onto it with all these squares because it's much easier for us to handle, right? And you mentioned right. in the last episode that that's how we create our cities and, and our systems and our, our stuff to cohere more with the grid-like uh, way of viewing the world, right? But it's yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. it's a cool so, intuition. So the, to the go- world has a cert- the world has a certain amount of that. It's 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 amenable to that kind of parsing to a certain degree. Um, yes. And and then wh- where we where we interact with the world, we often make it more like that to make it easier for us to interact with. But the point mm-hmm. is that the world is all, not all perfectly amenable to this kind of perfectly discrete object like representation. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what yeah. it means to say it's nebulous. It's not spooky. I mean, it, it seems spooky uh, when you don't drill drill into the details, but it isn't it isn't a spooky claim. It's just saying, you know, like it's not it's not controversial to say that, you know, forests aren't divided into perfectly definite grids, you know, like. Um, right. Right. And it, it, it's a similar claim that's being made here. Um, so that was that was properties. Right. And, you know, ontology yep. is is objects, categories, properties and relationships. Right. So. We talked about categories last time. So, um, you know, to say that something objectively fits in the category of chair, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not clear that there there's sort of an objective list of attributes out there that you could... Well, first off, we just problematize this idea of attributes as being objective, right? But, so, but um, uh, even if you want to say, okay, they're objective attributes, you know, and then things that fit in the same category just share a certain number of attributes... Uh, for any list of attributes you'd want to list that that you know are supposed to exhaustively uh, and narrowly define the concept of chair, I could come up with something that you would call a chair that wouldn't fit that 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 list. Um, uh, yeah. So so that's just not what's going on when we come up with categories. Categories have this sort of family resemblance quality. Uh, they're not you know pre rule specified. You know this goes back to what we we're talking about uh, with uh, Wittgenstein and and you know. Uh, language um there aren't pre-given rules there are like patterns of use within a community uh and and uh to think that you have to be represent it's it's not that there aren't emergent things that are well described kind of like rules rather what's going on when you abide by those rules which is to say when you put all the right things in the concept of, in the category of chair is not having a list in your head of all the uh, the attributes that make up the category of chair and then sit, and then matching the thing you see to that you're not representing the rules right what you've learned are like essentially like you know it's a bunch of things but like you know chairs are things that you can sit in and and other other sort of ways the term is used the category is used um such that when you encounter a new thing you can you can uh figure out whether it should fit in the category not here's a pre-given list of rules for for what the category of chair contains um so anyway yeah so 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 uh and and what will make up that category and this is the other piece of this neither subjective nor objective but interactive is not purely objective things right it's going to include things like to what purpose to what uses can i put this given the kind of organism that I am, right? A chair is not a chair to an alien. Not because they're fallible, um, in the sense <laughs> that they just haven't figured out what's objectively out there, but because but because that's not a relevant level of construal for them. You know, it's not, it's not the right way of thinking about the world for them. They don't parse it that way because the parsing itself into categories is relative to the purposes and context of the organism. I mean, I, I, yeah, I think this is very interesting to think about. And I mean, I w- when you're saying this now, I got images in my own head of like, to me, I have hands and I have arms and shoulders and all these things. And it makes sense for us to make those distinctions. And we, we can point out and say, oh, my shoulder hurts. That's different from saying my hand hurts. Like there's a use there. But the fact of the matter is there's no objective way to differentiate between what's my hand and where my wrist begins and when my forearm starts. And like, it's kind of a cool thing to think about. And I, I think I 
Um, and I think this this has implications for how you live in the world uh, and and meaning on the spiritual end as well. But mm. I think I've lived a lot of my life through this formal, abstract way of seeing reality, like a f- formalism, a cut up way of viewing reality, like kind of living through the map instead of the territory. That old chestnut. But I think that's important. Yeah, yeah. I think, like you said, has a tie into to nihilism and the meaning crisis and stuff like that. But um, yeah, maybe now it's not the time. But, it, but it's just an interesting point. Yeah. No. No. I, I mean, I think that I think that's that's that's. It, it it's it is helpful to bring up right which is like uh one of the strange common features of of people who are attracted to chapman stuff is that they tend to have two attributes and if one is missing that they're not super into it uh one is that they tend to be into cognitive science and philosophy and then the other mm-hmm. is that they tend to be into buddhism <laughs> um not an accident you know he's writing about about those two things effectively but but um uh meditation and you know spiritual experience more generally does make some of this stuff make more sense right like like you know if you, uh, you just mentioned you know paying attention to the sensations associated with your hand try to tell me you know where the boundary is uh you will you will not find one now the critical rationalist response to this is to say that you know like uh you're not having direct perceptions of any of this stuff i, I think i think we'd sort of table that but but the um certainly nebulosity can become more evident in the context of meditation or a psychedelic experience or or whatever else. Yeah. 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 So the way I understand the three-way distinction there between reasonableness, rationality, and meta-rationality is that, uh, yeah, reasonableness is a, yeah, non-systematic way of thinking and acting. It's this kind of improvisational dance with the environment that we spoke about last time. So it's like, instead of coming up with these uh, representations, performing the the uh, formal logic, creating the plan beforehand, and then just executing the plan, it's more a matter of, yeah, like when you make breakfast, you're, you're uh, dealing with things as they come up. And so, yeah, things like making breakfast, getting from A to B, like driving, uh, having everyday conversations and stuff like that, just most of what we do. And yep. it's a way of dealing with the nebulous world by this improvisational uh, activity. And so rationality uh, on this conception is when you're abstracting away to the formal realm where you're actually doing this, dividing the world up in pieces because it kind of gives you the extra power of being able to deduce things from other things and the the flip that we spoke about last time the ethnomethodological flip is from seeing the routine activity the reasonableness as being a faulty approximation of rationality to viewing it the other way around where since we the world is actually nebulous you need reasonable activity to bridge between this formal abstraction to the actual world like something like that yeah yeah no that that's that's almost exactly right so so i like the, the, <laughs> okay. especially that last bit is is, is perfect there's uh, there are like right. a, um uh just to not give a sort of uh misimpression about reasonableness um mm-hmm. uh and and rationality so so um it's not true to say that um reasonableness doesn't divide the world up into ontologies uh it's 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 just like like you you, you are parsing the world um oh yeah i forgot to that, say yeah 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 it's heavily context and purpose dependent so your your way of cutting it up is dependent on what you're trying to do yes yeah exactly so so the the crucial characteristic of reasonableness is that it's sort of uh helplessly context and purpose laden and then yes <clears throat> rationality on this understanding is really anything that um uh for the purposes of context and purpose independence so the purposes of generality the purposes of of um you know say you wanted to write up a set of rules for how to do the job no matter who you are and when you're when you're when you're doing the job mm-hmm. that's the kind of thing that he means by rationality here you know it's a set of uh, it could be like you know algorithmic stepwise defined procedures it can be systematic you know sets of justifications it can be uh perfectly definite you know, quote unquote, formal ontologies. Um, so, so you know, categories that are trying to be uh, precisely defined, 
independent of context and purposes. Now, you never fully yes. sort of escape context and purposes, except for in something like mathematics or something. But but um, the yeah, that that's that's the aspiration of rationality is to move more in that direction for the purposes of because it gives you a lot of power to do that, right? Like, uh, um, and I don't mean power in some pejorative sense. I just mean like it's a powerful move. <laughs> you know, abstraction is a powerful move, right? Um, yeah, and um, so, so 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 that's that's the point of rationality. And yet, as you said, it needs reasonableness to mediate its relationship to the world. It sort of can't function unaided. And it's not that that's the that that's the real thing. You know, when you're doing rationality on this view you're now doing epistemology where before you were just doing some shitty evolved heuristic thing you're still mm-hmm. using all the same faculties that you're you were using for reasonableness it's just that you know to to go back to our our sort of very loose picture of you know things in the head and their relatedness to things in the world you know you're sort of instrumentally hardening the sense of how how the things in your head are related to the thing in the world to get this generality and that will work in some ways and it won't work in others and you have to have an understanding of when when it will and won't work in order to deploy it effectively. Um, you know, so it, it, for for some purposes, it's really helpful to have a list of formal procedures, uh, mm-hmm. and it will eventually break down for one or another reason because you can't anticipate everything. Uh, yeah, and and you have to be able to do something when when it breaks down. You know, like you you, you couldn't just have the formal procedure. So anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. Well said. Uh, yeah, so I think I think I think you got that exactly right. And then did did you want to take a crack at meta rationality? Yeah, so meta rationality I guess is the part that I understand the least and uh to my defense Chapman hasn't finished writing that part of the book. I don't think he's written much at all uh about yes. that <laughs> as far as I understand. So this is on you David. Uh but yeah, no so so meta rationality is when you uh go outside of systems and it's more about choosing uh the right uh, system for the task at hand, rather. So like evaluating yes. what type of reasoning or method to use for a particular problem. Yes, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so that, that's certainly one thing that, that, that uh, meta-rationality can do. So, you know, go meta to systems, so to speak, rational systems, and mm-hmm. compare, reflectively relate different systems. Um, it can also reflective re- reflect upon the relationship between reasonableness and rationality um but mm-hmm. in a in a more expansive way than what he calls circumrationality which is kind of like the parable of the pebbles thing that we were talking about last time so you know circumrationality is all this sort of reasonable work you have to do around something rational like counting in that case to make it work you know so like figuring out what counts as a pebble you know that kind of thing or what counts as a sheep yeah you know like yeah. um that's that's not quite meta rational, um, but it's you know it's, it's sort of the reasonable activity that makes rationality work, um, and it, it requires that you understand counting. So it still requires that you understand something rational, right? Um, uh, right. Meta rationality is 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 more capacious than that, um, but it includes doing things like reflectively relating reasonableness to rationality. Um, so this might sound hopelessly abstract, and it's certainly different than like the way this word rationality is getting used it's it is very different than it gets used from the standpoint of rationalisms but it's a helpful distinction in the sense that okay rationality defined this way as just you know uh you know the word formal is a little bit vague uh, but uh you know formal definite ontologically precise procedures and you know sets of objects categories and properties properties and relationships that aspire to generality context and purpose independence things like that right so all these attributes that we were listing last time as sort of cognitivist assumptions right like rationality should work whomever is doing the rationality and in whatever context they're in and you know like that's that's the idea like general principles of intellection that's that's the idea here um yes and th- that's where the power lies like you said yes exactly for for certain purposes for certain um, problems yeah, yeah yeah if you tried to just use rationality to make breakfast you would fail Right. So it's not it's not this, this is the <laughs> difference between so a, a rationalism so, on, on his view, which is just like a sort of philosophical view that, you know, vastly exaggerates the power of, of rationality. Um, uh, a rationalism would say when you're making breakfast, you are somehow approximating if, you, if it's working, you're somehow approximating perfect formal rationality. 
however defined in your in your given rational system and he would say no <laughs> that would not work <laughs> and <laughs> and uh you're not doing anything like that so yeah but so wait okay so so does this mean that you make your breakfast eggs irrationally jake Yes, I, 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 you're an irrational I only, I, egg you know, maker, bro. You, you should see how much egg I get on the walls. I've never made breakfast successfully. I'm just an irrational <laughs> breakfast maker. Exactly. Do you even reason, uh, bro? Yeah, yeah, obviously not. Um, okay, so so uh, but maybe maybe that's a helpful thing to focus on. So so, uh, you know, irrational as a sort of like pejorative uh, comes. It's it's not like this view is certainly not endorsing irrationality, right? Uh, it's just saying not everything is a rational process uh, understood in this particular sense of rational that we were talking about before. Uh, and um, not everything that's non-rational is irrational, you could say. <laughs> uh, irrationality right, right. would be, you know, in a domain where rationality is the right tool for the job, you're contradicting, and, and, like, and, and abiding by its dictates would work, you're contradicting its dictates. You know, that's, that's irrationality. Which this yeah, is not endorsing, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, just to maybe maybe sort of flesh out people's conception of of reasonableness a little bit. So the kinds of things that fall under the banner of reasonableness are like perception, right? So perception is heavily context and purpose dependent. It's always from a particular perspective. The way you're seeing the world, it, like like my sensory faculties are different than another organism's sensory faculties. Uh, you know, it's 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 as I said, it's perspectival. Uh, you also perceive in terms of meaning, right? So um, you're 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 not just seeing the world uh, exactly as it is. You're seeing it relative to your sort of context and purposes. Um, and there's this very tight feedback loop between perception and action, such that you know um, you're you're continually reconsulting the world, getting feedback, and then looking in a different way, looking in a different place. You know. Uh, it feels like there's just sort of a perfectly precise visual scene, but you'd actually need to do something, namely look more closely if you wanted to drill down in the details of like, you know, what's happening on in the corner of my eye there or whatever. So right. reasonableness is, is sort of depends on these type of feedback loops. Again, you know, thinking about this idea of like dealing with messy, nebulous reality, because you couldn't anticipate all, all of it in advance, reasonableness has you up in amongst it you know, getting continual feedback from it so that you don't have to do that, so that you can defer to the world effectively um, in an ongoing way as you're, as you're carrying out your, your activity, your purpose. Um, and it's, it, by the way, it's crucial to think about this all the time. It's just like, you're always engaged in certain projects. You're always engaged in certain activities. Even, even, you know, even when you're meditating, even when you're doing nothing, you're still kind of engaged in certain projects. There's certain like normative ends to, to, to which you're uh, working you know, not necessarily explicitly conceived as such, but um, that's what that's what sort of drives reasonable activity forward is relative to your purposes is going to be, you know, do you need to look more closely? Do you need to do this? Do you need to do that? You know, um, and, you know, we talked before about how rationalism and cognitivism are subject to these sort of relevance problems or these combinatorial explosion problems. So if you have a rationalist conception of how you do categories or planning, mm -hmm. um you know, uh, because of the inability to take into account unenumerably many possibilities, uh, you you wouldn't be able to reason at all if you tried to reason that way, uh, as as you know, naive rationalism or cognitivism would say you you are, and you can think about this, you know, embodied, embedded, and active. You know, these are three of the four E's things that are happening with reasonableness as ways of solving those relevance problems, right? So by being in the world, you know, looking in a particular direction, uh, bumping up against particular pieces of the world, you know, so to speak, uh, that's doing the relevance realization for you. You know what I mean? Like that's already narrowing the scope of reasoning just because your right. context is particular, you know? So you could exchange the uh, perception is theory laden with perception is meaning laden, perhaps. Yes, yeah, yeah, I think that's that's uh, precisely so. It's also theory laden in some cases, right? So if you're a theoretical yeah. physicist, you know, and you're looking through, you know, the telescope or whatever, you're you're seeing in part in terms of the theories. But 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 yes, yeah, meaning laden is is a very good way to think about it. 
Yeah, I've been I've been thinking about the uh the loop between perception, action, and cognition that you uh spilled out last time. And I've noticed mm. more and more in my everyday life, like just how you know, I'm sitting uh watching TV or doing something else, and then I have my phone screen up on the table, and then it lights up uh because I get a text and immediately I move my head towards it to see what's going on there, yep. right? Um, yeah, it's actually really cool. <laughs> I, I like I like the feeling of being more embedded in a world rather than standing apart from it, reasoning about it uh, completely separately. But um, yeah, that was just a uh, an observation I made since last time. No, yeah, I I, I think that that's that's useful. Like it, it, you really do get these sort of. Uh well first off you you were you were always already doing that right so it's not like you weren't you were ever like it's not like you were outside of the world and outside of time and space beforehand and now you you're still oh, no. in it no yeah. no no but but I just but had a theory not, that not, I was exactly yeah so not having this theoretical overlay that says my reasoning I should be reasoning as though I were outside of time and space does yeah give you this deeper sense of immersion which is is useful yeah yeah and now it can just blame everything else you know. It's never my fault. <laughs> yeah. Just that damn nebulous world. All right. So it's getting late here for me. I think it's time for us to end it here. Um, yeah. Really fun this time too. I, I already can't wait to listen to it four times <laughs> and get all the stuff that I missed. Nice. Um, and uh, I think it can be good to do them a little shorter like this as well. And then just hear back what people are confused about and we can, uh, Keep going. I want to. I want to touch on spiritual stuff. Like there was some guy on Twitter who spoke about the um, uh, why yourself is not a spiritual obstacle or some post like that from yeah, Chapman yeah. that I think is amazing. Uh, that coupled with there are no spiritual problems. That's an episode I'd love to do uh, fairly soon. Actually, cool. Yeah, let's let's make that the next one. That sounds good. All right, man. Take care. All right, take care.